Okay, sorry. So, uh, until now, I've described what we would call the plain vanilla version of the algorithm. And, um, uh, but uh, there are a number of things that one can do relatively easily, which greatly improves the efficiency of it. And from a point of view of applications, of course, that's very, very important. Um, so the first thing is uh, that um, whenever we're dealing with uh, systems in which the number of uh, uh, up and down electrons is the same, that's a very common uh, instance, actually. Most singlets that we deal with, uh, most systems that we deal with are singlets in which uh, this, is a, uh, uh, this is actually, you have the same number of uh, up electrons as down electrons. And uh, in that case, um, you can, instead of working with individual slater determinants, of course, I should be point out that if you have a, an arbitrary slater determinant with um, a certain number of open shell, open shell orbitals, in other words, orbitals with only one, one electron in them, that typical, th those type of slater determinants are not spin eigenfunctions. In other words, if you apply the S-squared operator onto that, you do not generate a constant multiplied by the original, uh, by the original um, uh, operator. And it's a very interesting question as to how one can reformulate FCI-QMC in terms of uh, pure spin eigenfunctions. In other words, linear combinations of determinants that are pure spin eigenfunctions. Of course, we know how to do that in principle, but unfortunately, practical implementations is very slow. And um, you know, we haven't cracked that problem quite yet. But there is a useful symmetry which one can nevertheless uh, uh, adopt, which is rather than working with, with uh, uh, linear combinations of, de of determinants that have a fixed definite amount uh, 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 spin, you can work... Uh, in, in cases where you have this uh, 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 equal numbers of alpha and beta electrons, you can work with um, linear combinations of determinants and, a de and, and its partner determinant in which all the spins have been flipped. Um, so, in other words, if you have an open shell, let's say you have uh, an up electron in this orbital and a down electron in this one, when you flip it, you get this particular combination. And it's easy to show that in the exact uh, uh, solutions, uh, those linear combinations always occur either with a plus sign or a minus sign. And the plus sign always refers to uh, even spin, and the minus sign always refers to odd spins. So, and, and so, this is, uh, so these particular very simple linear combinations that does not greatly complicate the matrix element calculation is something that we routinely impose now. And actually, the neon atom calculation we ran yesterday uh, was actually using the spin-flip symmetry. And it has the advantage that it immediately reduces, uh, it filters out, let's say, the, the odd spin states, which is a good thing. You don't have triplets, for example, left. Uh, it halves the Hilbert space. It enables your time step to be a bit longer, and so on. So this is a very beneficial, uh, beneficial uh, transformation, uh, almost trivial to, to implement. So this is done routinely now. OK. And uh, we'll do some demonstrations uh, on the N2 molecule, where, again, we will uh, use this uh, all the time. OK. Now. Um, a big improvement on, on our fully stochastic algorithm uh, was proposed two or three years uh, after we we'd, we'd um, uh, proposed FCI-QMC. And uh, Cyrus Umriga uh, said that, well, it's all very well doing things stochastically, everything stochastically, but actually, if you can uh, incorporate some degree of uh, determinism in the calculation, which you can generally do, that will only help. Uh, that will only help the algorithm. And so they propose the following variation on FCI QMC uh, that they call the semi-stochastic algorithm. And the idea is uh, to select a small subset of determinants, uh, 
uh, which they call the deterministic space. And they had a particular prescription as to how you should select this subset. We have a different prescription as to how we select this subset, but let's leave aside that question uh, for a moment. And um, typically, uh, D uh, will maybe a thousand determinants. Actually, in our implementation, it could go up to about a million determinants. Uh, so that's the typical uh, number. And the idea is that whenever you're doing, this is the force update uh, on a uh, particular, so, so this is the, if you like, the imaginary time Schrodinger equation, which gives you the, the, the update uh, on, let's say, the number of walkers on determinant i. And you now divide this into three terms, whereas before we'd only divided it into two terms. You have the same death step as per normal. But now, uh, what Umrigar said is that for the determinants that are inside the deterministic space, you can actually perform this summation uh, exactly. So you have the set of uh, walkers that reside in the deterministic space and just uh, perform this matrix vector multiplication uh, exactly. And then you have an, uh, the terms which are sitting outside of the deterministic space, so this d prime. And uh, you would do the spawning step uh, uh, of uh, normal SCIQMC uh, as per normal. So in other words, um, so you have, let's say, so this is your uh, deterministic uh, step. So you update the coefficients within the deterministic step according to the exact formula. And then you have a set of spawning terms that take you from the deterministic uh, into, the, into this huge space, the rest of the Hilbert space. Uh, so that's one type of term. You have a set of terms where you spawn from the rest of the space back into the, uh, into the uh, deterministic space. And you have also spawnings within the... Uh, within the, uh, uh, the huge space. So those are, do are done um, uh, uh, as per the uh, spawning step of FCIQMC. And um, so that's one thing. And, and as we'll do the demonstration, that dramatically reduces the stochastic fluctuations uh, of the algorithm. So what we do in practice is we actually select this deterministic set on the fly. So we run a normal FCI-QMC calculation, and at some point we say, okay, let's harvest the, let's say, thousand most important determinants that it's determined by itself at that stage, and we put those into the deterministic uh, uh, space. And we then continue the calculation uh, using the semi-stochastic uh, update. So that means that we keep this black box feature of the algorithm that we think is, uh, is very important. So we don't want an a priori selection of what should be in the deterministic space and what shouldn't be. Uh, so that's the way we actually do it in practice. So then the other thing uh, that Omriga that, 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 that uh, pointed out is that when we're calculating the trial, uh, the, the projected energy, um, rather than simply using, let's say, the Hartree-Fock determinant uh, as your trial wave function, you can just use a multi-determinental uh, expansion uh, of this kind. So we have another subset of determinants which, which form the trial uh, wave function. And this, this uh, subset need not be the same as the deterministic uh, 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 set. In fact, the deterministic spaces are usually much larger than what we can afford for the trial wave function. Um, and so you have this trial wave function, which is now a specific linear combination of, uh, of stated determinants. And these coefficients, ci, for the trial wave function are obtained by diagonalizing the Hamiltonian in the, in the set of uh, determinants that you've chosen in the trial space. So you set up the Hamiltonian in this space, diagonalize it, and that gives you these CI coefficients. And uh, you then 
perform your, uh, your projection onto that trial weight function rather than onto the Hartree-Fock weight function. Now, so in practice, um, uh, the method does incur a memory bottleneck because the application of H to the trial weight function uh, basically um, connects the trial wave function to the double excitations of the trial wave function. And that is, uh, so you have to store the vector, which is the application of uh, the Hamiltonian onto the uh, trial wave function. And that is essentially the, uh, the memory bottleneck of this trial wave function technique, um, uh, which in fact means that we cannot afford huge trial spaces uh, in general. But it's still, nevertheless, better than having a single state determinant. And you can see, in particular, where you have problems in which, let's say, the Hartree-Fock determinant itself has, a, let's say, a small uh, uh, overlap with the exact wave function. And so you end up with the small denominators. This method greatly helps, because you end up uh, accumulating more, uh, more overlap between the trial wave function and the sampled wave function in the denominator. And that greatly helps the, uh, the, um, the simulation. OK, so what we can do now, let me uh, fire up a simulation. So you see this in practice. Um, So what we're going to do is the N2 molecule uh, um, with 100,000 walkers. And um, I'm going to put 5,000 so that after 5,000 steps, after the system has gone into uh, variable shift mode, um, we will switch on the semi-stochastic algorithm. So you'll see one simulation where it's converging and it's got one set of uh, fluctuations, and then you see what happens when you switch on the semi-stochastic algorithm. And then at the same point, after 5,000 steps in the variable shift mode, we'll also switch on the trial wave function, and we'll take uh, 500 uh, uh, determinants in the trial wave function and here I put a thousand determinants in the uh, in the um, in the uh, deterministic wave function. Okay, so let's just launch this job. Uh, any luck, it'll run. Okay. So the first thing that we're going to do is a, is a standard uh, simulation. Let's just fire up the number of walkers. OK, so you can see the number of walkers here. It started off at 10, and it's growing, and it's approaching the 100,000 that was our target. And here, this is the number of walkers on the Hartree Fock determinant, uh, which is also growing. It's reaching about a thousand or so. So now we've already reached the hundred thousand uh, limit. So it's gone into variable shift mode. So it's stabilizing the population uh, in the whole space. And here you can see it's also stabilizing the population on the uh, on the uh, Hartree Fock determinant. So it's growing. So that's fine. Let's just see what the energy is looking like. OK. So again, uh, it starts off here at the Hartree-Fock energy. It exhibits these large fluctuations because there are very few walkers in the simulation at that time. And now it's uh, stabilizing. see uh, uh, it's stabilizing so let's just put the exact energy on 
I'll, uh, it, I'll display it from the beginning. And there is the exact energy, you see. It is pretty remarkable. I mean, to get that exact energy to do a conventional full CI calculation would take probably a day or so on a large machine that we have more or less instantaneously hit uh, here. You can still see, of course, it's, uh, there are some fluctuations. Um, so this is a problem with a, with a Hilbert space of about 500 million, 540 million to be precise. And uh, it's going. So let me just see when it went into variable shift. Um, how am I going to do that? Okay, so that's the shift uh, expressed in the correlation energy. So it was roughly around time step 4,000. So let's just go back. So it went into variable shift mode at roughly here. So, and we had set it to go into semi-stochastic mode 5,000 steps afterwards. So in a few seconds, it will, uh, the simulation should be reaching uh, Ah, I think it's already got there. Do you see this uh, reduction in noise uh, as it goes into uh, as it goes into semi-stochastic mode? Um, so let's now blow it up. I think I'll uh, write out uh, from let's say time step four thousand just to. Uh, blow this up. <clears throat> yeah, so you clearly see the point at which it turns on the uh, semi-stochastic algorithm. So you have fluctuations which are on the order of, so this is one millihart tree. What you see, that distance is one millihart tree. So before you had fluctuations on the order of several millihart trees. And as soon as you turn on the semi-stochastic, uh, you get this. Um, this reduction. In. Uh, in fluctuations. OK, now this is still with respect to projection onto the Hartree-Fock determinant. Now let's look at the energy uh, if we also project onto the uh, onto the trial wave function. I'll do it from the same. Um, so the the second estimator here in green is now with respect to projection onto this 500 determinant uh, trial energy uh, uh, trial wave function. So you can see the, the, the oscillations in green are still yet smaller than the oscillations uh, in red. And you can uh, let this uh, simulation now equilibrate uh, under its own steam. Um, but it's sort of pretty, pretty interesting to see that the kind of fluctuations that we're now uh, uh, measuring are essentially on the order of a milliartery, which is a tiny, tiny energy, actually. And the idea is then, do you let this run for many, many thousands of steps? And of course, one then uh, uh, accumulates averages over these, uh, over these values. So that is... Uh, the, uh, the semi-stochastic algorithm. Um, I should point out that the se so the semi-stochastic algorithm essentially improves the efficiency by reducing the fluctuation. So if you wanted to hit the same stochastic error with the original method, you'd of course have to run considerably longer. And um, so Cyrus actually uh, quantified this. Um, in this plot, which comes from his paper. So here, um, uh, you see this is the carbon dimer and VTZ, so it's very similar to the calculation that we're, uh, 
running at the moment. And so this is efficiency, essentially measures as the square of the error times the time. And uh, as a function of both the size of the, uh, of the uh, um, uh, deterministic space, so you get some modest increase in efficiency uh, as you increase the uh, deterministic space. But as you also increase the size of the trial, a deter uh, trial wave function here, so this is with a wave function trial determiner with 165 uh, determinants, you see that uh, you have already a factor of 200 in, in efficiency. And uh, if you can afford a, an even larger trial wave function with, let's say, 1,700 or so, uh, and you use a deterministic space on the order of 10,000, then the efficiency gain here is on the order of 1,000 or so. I mean, that's a staggering amount of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of efficiency gain. Uh, um, and uh, I should point out that, you know, in our, in, in our, in our implementation of the semi-stochastic algorithm, we don't, there's virtually no um, overhead associated with this. Uh, so as long as you can store the, uh, as long as you can store this, uh, the action of the Hamiltonian on the trial wave function, that's the only memory bottleneck, all the subsequent actual calculations incur virtually negligible costs. So you get this benefit uh, more or less for free. Sorry, what are the red crosses? The red crosses? The red line. So this is for an inappropriately chosen trial wave function. So, so the choice of the trial wave function actually uh, makes a difference, yeah. So here you can have a huge trial wave function that was inappropriately chosen, and it doesn't buy you very much, yeah. So this is why we actually decided, so we didn't use their prescription as to how to choose uh, both the deterministic and the trial space. We just let it uh, emerge from the calculation itself, yeah. Okay, now... Um, uh, so, a second uh, major improvement, so we gained a factor of 1,000 uh, uh, with respect to the original algorithm by adopting the semi-stochastic algorithm. But then there's another pretty serious um, uh, bottleneck, which is to do with the time step in FCIQMC. So you'll recall that the generation probabilities, so if you're sitting in a determinant, uh, and you have to randomly choose another determinant which is connected to it, then as the connectivity of the Hamiltonian increases, and it increases both as the basis set increases and as the number of electrons increases, uh, you end up having to reduce your time step uh, in, the, in the same rate at which the generation probabilities are reducing. And, uh, and so, that, so if, you do, if you just do uniform uh, generation, then the time step uh, scales as n squared, uh, m squared uh, to the minus one. And so this is actually a, uh, an example for the nitrogen molecule. So at a VDZ level, which is like a moderate size basis, you have a time step that's about 10 to the minus three, or let's say three or four times 10 to the minus three. And then as you increase the basis set to triple zeta and then quadruple zeta, you see that the time step gets smaller and smaller and smaller, simply because in this case we're keeping the number of electrons fixed, it's just the same molecule, but we're increasing m. And uh, so, so the way m increases is as the cube power of these cardinal uh, numbers. So m is increasing quite sharply, and then we further incur a, an m squared. Uh, so that really hits us badly. So for large basis sets, we end up with tiny time steps. And so from one step to the next, the system hardly moves at all. And that's a problem. Um, so you can see that there are actually two problems uh, here. Um, one is the fact that in, in, in realistic calculations, the... Uh, um, the actual distribution of Hamiltonian matrix elements uh, can vary quite widely. I mean, so you might have one connection 
that's of strength 0.1 and many, many connections that are, let's say, a couple of orders of magnitude smaller than it. And of course, if you were just to select these things with uniform probability, so if you're sitting on, on this determinant and you're selecting A with uniform probability, you would be selecting it with, uh, with um, a probability a quarter. And so the spawning probability in that case would be tau times the Hamiltonian matrix element, which in this case is 0.1, divided by a quarter. And so you'd be spawning with the probability that's given by 0.4 times, uh, uh, times tau. Whereas if you were to attempt to spawn on B, then the same thing would give you a spawning probability of 0 0.004 times tau, simply because the ma this matrix element is, is that much smaller. And so the largest allowable uh, value of tau is actually set by this uh, uh, less probable uh, event, um, this one. And you would find that in these units, tau would be 2.5 for this for this problem. And that would mean that every time you attempted to spawn on A, you would spawn with probability 1, but every time you attempted to spawn on B, you would only be spawning 1 in 100 times. And this is a problem, uh, so you'd have both a high rejection rate, um, uh, which, is, uh, which is always a bad thing from the Monte Carlo perspective, because uh, you know, all, the, all the effort that, that, that you or well, the numeric computational effort to generate a move, essentially every time you reject it, gets discarded. So what we would much prefer to do is to have a scheme whereby the generation probability becomes somewhat, in fact, in the ideal case, exactly proportional to the, uh, to the Hamiltonian matrix elements uh, uh, themselves. Because uh, in that case, the spawning probability, which would be the time step times well, it's the Hamiltonian matrix element divided by the generation probability. If this proportionality were exact, that would just be times a constant. And that would be great because then you could choose your constant to be your, 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 your time step to be 1 divided by your constant. And that would mean that every time you attempted to spawn, you would actually, uh, you would actually spawn. So you would have zero rejection rate. And that, in some sense, would be the, uh, would be the ideal um, would be the ideal algorithm. Now, the problem is that you can actually do this. Uh, you can ensure exact uh, proportionality, but that involves setting up cumulative probability functions that themselves cost order n squared m squared to set up. So that would, be, that would, be, would make the numerical effort essentially untenable for each, uh, for each spawning uh, that you'd make. So instead, um, we want to kind of, uh, well, yeah, this is kind of obvious. We want to kind of a, a, a smart way of making our selection, which doesn't involve the numerical effort of, of evaluating the Hamiltonian matrix elements over all the connections. And this can be actually achieved, uh, uh, at least this is the way we do it, by using a Cauchy-Schwarz decomposition of the, uh, of the Hamiltonian matrix elements. And these Cauchy-Schwarz distributions take only order m effort to set up rather than order n squared, m squared. So you pay a little bit, but you gain a lot uh, in doing so. OK, so, uh, so, this, is the, uh, so this is actually how, the, how our Cauchy-Schwarz scheme works. And I'll, and I'll explain it for opposite spin excitations. So let's say we got two electrons, I and J, that have opposite spins. Uh, uh, so let's say alpha electron and beta electron. And in that case, the Hamiltonian matrix element only consists of one term, because there is no equivalent exchange term. That exchange term is zero. Uh, for opposite spin excitations. And so in that case, the, the Hamiltonian matrix element is simply IJAB. Uh, let's say electron I with, let's say, alpha spin going to orbital A with alpha spin, and electron J with beta spin going to uh, hole B with uh, beta spin. OK. Now, what we want to do is to take this four-index object and essentially factorize it into something that only refers to two indices. Because 
once you can set up distributions on two indices, setting up it's much simpler than setting up distributions over four indices, in essence. So this is where the Cauchy-Schwarz um, identity uh, comes in, so that uh, one can show that, that this four-index integral, ijab, is less than or equal to the square root of. Uh, now, iaia is effectively the self-interaction of the transition density electron, you know, uh, uh, Ia with itself. And the same holds true for, um, for uh, the self-interaction of the transition density Jb uh, with itself. So that's, uh, that's Cauchy-Schwarz. And it turns out to be a very nice, uh, very rather sharp inequality. In other words, um, whenever this matrix element is zero, this turns out to be a good upper bound to it. Of course, there are, there are terms in which IJAB is actually zero, and of course this is never zero. But in that case, you can usually uh, um, uh, discard those because when IJAB is actually zero, it's usually zero because of symmetry, and you wouldn't bother to generate it in the first place. So you need, you need, you need to be able to take into account symmetry in your excitation generations, which is relatively easy to do, but um, otherwise it's it's a it's a good uh, it's a good inequality. Okay, so the idea is as follows. So what we have to do is what your excitation generator has to do is to return you four numbers i, j, a, and b. That's that's in essence what it uh, has to do. And uh, so the i, j refers to the electron pair, and a, b refers to the whole pair. Um, so the first thing is we write this, uh, so the probability of generating IJAB, we write uh, with this, uh, within the form of a conditional probability that uh, uh, we first of all select the electron pair IJ according to some uh, known scheme. That can be with uniform probability, for example. And then to select the whole pair AB given that we have selected uh, the electron pair IJ. And if uh, both these are computable according to algorithm, that will be sufficient to compute uh, the actual probability that you want. And then, uh, in the specific case of opposite spin excitations, this conditional probability can, it, can itself be decomposed uh, to be the probability of selecting whole A given electron I, that's of one spin, multiplied by the probability of selecting whole B uh, given uh, uh, electron J. That's of the opposite spin. So in the case of same spin into, uh, excitations, you also have to consider the reverse uh, way of selecting it, because in that case, uh, for a given electron pair IJ, you can select B first and then A, so to speak. So that's the only, uh, the only thing uh, to bear in mind. Okay, so that's so far so good. And now the idea is to select, uh, when you come to now look at this thing, probability of A given I, is you select the whole A given electron I according to the Cauchy-Schwarz, uh, that portion of the Cauchy-Schwarz uh, factor. So what this actually means in practice is that for every given electron I, you now have to form a cumulative probability uh, distribution that involves summing over all uh, available holes A. Okay, that essentially sets up this probability distribution. And this is what costs order M to, uh, to, uh, to calculate. And then you can now, once you set up this cumulative probability function, you can now select your whole A uh, um, out, of that, uh, uh, out of that function. And it turns out to be a really smart way of doing it. In other words, whenever the whole A interacts strongly with electron I and whole B interacts strongly with electron J, that leads you to large uh, IJAB matrix elements, and that's the trick. So, uh, uh, so what you actually see is a double benefit um, so this was the, the way the time step went for the nitrogen molecule as you, uh, as you increase the uh, basis set. 
And now with the Cauchy-Schwarz trick, you, see, you still see a decrease actually in the time step. So it's not absolutely ideal, but uh, I mean the decrease is still uh, very much contained. But even more important is the fact that you're actually rejecting many, many fewer moves at the same time. And that overall incre uh, in uh, increases the efficiency uh, of the algorithm. So what's shown here is the CPU cost per walker per successful time, per successful spawn, per unit time. So that's a measure of the, uh, of the efficiency of the algorithm, uh, so to speak. And so you can see that whereas before, with the standard uniform scheme, this cost would rise very sharply as you uh, increase the basis set, simply because uh, you were rejecting so many moves. Uh, you know, if you just make random moves with large basis sets, the probability of actually hitting something, uh, uh, large matrix elements is really going down, and that means that your rejection rate is going up. Here you can see the cost, uh, again, increases fairly moderately as you... Um, as you go from a small basis set to a uh, large basis set. So that is, um, uh, that is our uh, trick with... Uh, um, and so for, for something like the quadruple zeta basis sets, we gain, uh, you see, almost a factor of 1,000 or so, again, in efficiency. So for these large basis set calculations, when you combine our Cauchy-Schwarz sampling with Omrigar's... Um, semi-stochastic algorithm, we're about a factor of a million more efficient than we were uh, with, the plain, with the plain vanilla algorithm. So that's a, that's a really very significant, um, very significant gain. Okay, so that uh, finishes uh, that portion of, of, of the talk, um, which more or less describes the state of the art as we have it uh, with our code. Um, we are working a little bit more on, on, on these Cauchy-Schwarz things, but I, the gains we're seeing uh, are no, lo no more as dramatic. Uh, so there's maybe a factor of two more to be gained, but I don't think there is uh, any more. Okay, so now comes another topic, very important, which is, okay, so you've done this Monte Carlo simulation, and you've got this very accurate energy, but what have you actually learned about the system? Um, and so... You know, how can you actually analyze the results that you have? Um, and that basically brings us to uh, another topic, which is how to calculate properties. Um, so the wave function, of course, uh, um, is, a, is a very, very heavy object in general. And... Uh, when you want to calculate anything from it, or if you want to understand anything from it, you have to try to somehow compress the information uh, that you have uh, uh, in it. And the way, the best way to do it is to evaluate um, uh, uh, what are essentially primitive expectation values or, or, op or expectation values of primitive operators. And the most primitive operators that you can think of that preserve the number of electrons are, let's say, double annihilation uh, followed by double creation. That's, a, that's, if you like, is the generic uh, uh, operator uh, that uh, you want to be able to handle. And uh, so these four indices, R, S, uh, P, and Q, uh, give rise to a, basically a, a tensor or a matrix that we call the reduced density matrix. So I should point out that, of course, there are many theories on, on how to optimize the reduced density matrices themselves as a means of doing electronic structure calculation. But this is not what we're doing. We're not concerned about, let's say, n representability conditions on these reduced density matrices. The only thing we're concerned about is, given our wave function, psi, how can you calculate this two-body uh, reduced density matrix. And of course, this has got four indices, so it's got roughly m to the four storage associated with it. Um, and once you've got the two-body uh, reduced density matrix, you can then trace out one of the electrons to get uh, the one-body density matrix. So this two-body density matrix, in a way, is the most fundamental quantity uh, we would most often want to be able to deal with. Static quantity, it only refers to the ground state. Now, well, that's all very well, 
but now you see the problem that we face is that whereas before we were doing projections, so we had a trial wave function in the bra and the exact wave function in the ket, here we have actually got, unfortunately, the exact wave function both in the bra and the ket. So we have a, what is a quadratic functional of the, of the exact wave function uh, as opposed to a mixed estimator, which is just the linear functional of the, of the um, exact wave function. Um, so uh, uh, let me just point out that obviously if you've got your reduced density matrix, then any operator, which in this case can be written as a sum over two-body operators, can just be obtained simply by tracing the, your, your, your two-body operators represented in the same basis set together with, the, uh, uh, with, your, with your density matrix. So, for example, you can actually calculate the energy by tracing the Hamiltonian with your two-body density matrix. So, we, so this psi is an n-particle wave function. And uh, this uh, essentially, so what you've done is, uh, so you can think of essentially this, if you write it in, uh, in uh, uh, so if, if, you, if you work in first quantized form, you would normally write this as uh, R, R prime. So, Right, rather R1, R2, R1 prime, R2 prime. And that is basically your wave function, your n particle wave function, uh, R1, R2, all the way up to Rn, multiplied by R1 prime, R2 prime all the way up to Rn prime. And then you integrate out uh, particles R3 to Rn. And you do that same thing for the uh, prime variables. And then you multiply by, because it doesn't matter which pair of electrons you choose. So that's, that's the reduction. The reduction is that you're integrating uh, over the remaining n minus 2 particles. And that's essentially what you're doing here. So this, so this is a four-index object, PQRS, and that's exactly analogous to the four indices that you see uh, here. That's just in second quantized form. Yeah, that's all. So essentially, it's saying that if all you're ever concerned with are two-body operators, then the only information you need is the information that's contained in the, in the two-particle density matrix. Um, of course, there are some applications in which you need higher body density matrices. Um, but uh, let's just concentrate on, on this. OK, so the first thing is you can calculate the energy. This is the energy, of course, is known to be a simple functional of the two-particle density matrix. So if you give me the two-particle density matrix, I can return you the energy just by tracing it out. So this is the one body, and this is the two body, uh, two body operators. Now, the nice thing about this formalism is that there are a whole host of other properties that you can also calculate. And one of them, most valued, value, uh, valuable of all, is the nuclear gradients. So if R is, uh, is a description of some underlying uh, set of free, um, the degrees of freedom, such as the nuclear gradients, and you move your nuclear and you move your nuclei around. You want to know how much the energy is changing by. That is a very very important quantity to be able to calculate, and that can itself be written as a trace of again the one body density matrix with how the single particle uh, Hamiltonian varies with uh, the nuclear gradient. So that's traditionally called the Hellman Feynman force, and you have. Uh, 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 the the two-body density matrix and uh, tr uh, uh, traced out with how the two-particle uh, density uh, interactions are changing with um, 
with as you tweak the nuclei. And if you weren't dealing with atom-centered basis sets, these terms would be zero, so you wouldn't have to worry about them. But of course, we, do, we are dealing with atom-centered basis sets, and these are the so-called Poulet terms that we can also calculate. Now, fortunately, our quantum chemist friends, if you're use, using quantum chemical codes, actually produce you, for Gaussian basis sets, these entities are actually uh, available in analytic form. So they could just be read in together with the other four index integrals, so to speak. So that means that we can then uh, directly calculate the nuclear gradients uh, by tracing out, by tracing out the, uh, uh, these things. And then there are other uh, quantum, other entities such as the total spin, for example, which can be obtained in terms of the elements of the, of the uh, two-particle density matrix, and so on. Um, host of, um, of properties that can be calculated. Now, the question is, how can you calculate your uh, two-body density matrix? Well, if you take the, the, this original expression, and now you substitute for the CI, the CI expansion for your wave function, uh, what you get is the following expression for, for this element of the two-body density matrix, which is a sum over the Hilbert space of the system. And uh, for each uh, element of your Hilbert space, you take the CI coefficient for that, uh, for that determinant, and you multiply it into the CI coefficient uh, of the determinant that you get by exciting uh, your, the, the, the determinant I that you're on with the relevant excitation operators uh, that you've got. So that, and then you trace over that product uh, to get you this element of the uh, density matrix. And then you've got to repeat this m to the four times, essentially, uh, to get to fill your density matrix out. Of course, there are symmetry conditions that you would uh, use, uh, which are, have to be fulfilled by these indices. But those are relatively easy uh, to, to implement as well. OK, so this is obviously an exceedingly expensive uh, thing to do. And the question is, can we generate this density matrix on the fly as we're generating our wave function itself? And um, now the crucial point is that, in fact, when we're doing FCI QMC, we're actually sampling uh, over the Hamiltonian matrix elements, which means we're actually sampling over the double excitations. So for any given determinant, we sample over its connections uh, via the FCI QMC spawning step. And we want to use that uh, sampling step to, uh, to calculate the elements of the, of the density matrix. So how it works is you've got, um, let's say we're sitting on uh, determinant I, and we now want to find, we now attempt to spawn on determinant J. So that's, that's the basic step. And we know the probability of spawning. So we know that I go from determinant I to determinant J with a certain probability. So I'm now going to unbias with that probability when I come to multiply the relevant CI coefficients uh, together. So CI times CJ, I seem to have missed out a, a complex conjugate if it's relevant. So I divide essentially by the spawning probability, and I continue to accumulate this uh, for, each, um, uh, for each element of the, uh, of the density matrix. OK. OK, now, um, well, that sounds all very well and good, but there is a problem. And the problem is that we don't actually have the CI coefficients to begin with. All we've got are the populations of walkers. And uh, we only, the only thing that we know is that, the, is that the populations of walkers time average to give you the CI coefficients. But instantaneously, they're actually fluctuating entities. So the only thing that we can actually calculate in practice is not CI times CJ divided by the, gener by the spawning probability, but is the number of walkers on I instantaneously multiplied by the number of walkers on J instantaneously, and then time average that. And of course, we all know that the, the average of a product ain't the same thing as the product of the averages. So what we want is the product of the averages, but that's not something we have access to. Thank you.
Okay, so that is uh, 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 what we have uh, access to. So nevertheless, you can say, well, okay, let's, uh, let's uh, proceed boldly, as they say, and ignore the fact that uh, we have this correlation problem of, of, uh, of only being able to average the product rather than getting the product and the averages. What happens? Well, the answer is that uh, we get uh, very poor results. So that's an example uh, I show here. I think this is for a carbon molecule, C2 molecule. And in green, we see the, 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 the projected energy as it normally converges in, uh, in normal FCI QMC. Uh, so essentially, by the time you get to 10 million walkers, you've absolutely nailed the energy. You, you know, you're absolutely there. Yet, if you compute the energy that you get from, first of all, computing the density matrix, and then computing the energy from the density matrix, uh, this, you get this uh, uh, purple line here. So it is slowly, so there are two, two observations. The first thing is that it's variational. So it's always above the exact energy. And that's why it should be variational, because we are dealing with uh, symmetric expectation values. And that's the source of variationality. So that's good news is that at least you have variational energies. But the bad news is that it's a bit of a pyrrhic victory, because although it's variational, it's completely out. It's 50 milliheart trees out. And uh, it's furthermore, it's converging exceedingly slowly towards the exact answer. So probably you'd have to get down to a few billion walkers before the, this variational energy uh, uh, coincided anywhere to a reasonable accuracy with the, um, with the exact energy. And the same is seen. It's a bit less uh, it's dramatic in the case of a stretched nitrogen molecule, but the, uh, but the result is not very good. So why is our density matrix so poor? Uh, what, what is actually going on? So when we actually analyze the problem, it turns out that uh, the, um, uh, so this is, uh, we took a toy model which you can exactly diagonalize and so you could get the exact two-body density matrix. And then we compared the elements of the exact calculation with the stochastic calculation. And what we found was that the diagonal matrix elements that we were calculating were systematically biased. They were too large. And it didn't matter if we were doing a fully stochastic simulation or the semi-stochastic simulation. In both cases, uh, the diagonal matrix elements of our density matrix were too large. The errors are always positive, in other words. Whereas the off-diagonal matrix elements, the errors were somewhat better behaved, uh, distributed about zero. But the diagonal matrix elements were positive, biased to, to, to the positive. And so, now, what's wrong? Well, you can see that when you try to calculate this diagonal matrix element, uh, gamma PQ PQ, then what you have to do is to take uh, uh, the populational determinant I that contains the orbitals P and Q, and you square that, and then you average uh, the result. Um, now, you can see this uh, uh, induces a bias, because let's suppose we decompose the instantaneous number of walkers, ni, to be some unknown hypothetical number, ni exact. We don't know what that number is, plus some fluctuation. And by hypothesis, we're going to assume that the fluctuation time average is to zero. So the actual simulation, on average, is sampling the exact solution, but instantaneously is, is, is away from it. Then you can see that if you time average the square, you end up with the component that you actually want, which is the square of this uh, unknown exact component, plus the time average of the square of the fluctuation. And that is always a positive, uh, positive contribution to, uh, to, the, uh, to this uh, uh, object. And that leads you to the systematically biased uh, uh, density matrix elements. OK, so how do we solve this problem? And the problem is really uh, very beautiful. Uh, sorry, the, the solution uh, is, is very beautiful and uh, em essentially employs what we call the replica trick. So what we do is we do two simulations independent of each other. 
Uh, so we have two totally independent uh, simulations that don't talk to each other uh, at all. And then when we come to evaluate the matrix elements, what we take is the simula uh, from simulation one, we take the population on determinant i. And from simulation two, we take its population on uh, determinant i, rather than squaring the, the same population. And now you time average that. And of course, because the two populations are strictly uncorrelated, it's obvious that the fluctuations are strictly uncorrelated. In other words, if in simulation one, determinant i shows a positive fluctuation, there's no reason to suppose that in simulation two, it will also show a positive fluctuation. Sometimes it'll be positive, sometimes it's negative, and this actually uh, uh, cancels out exactly. And so, with this replica trick, you actually manage to exactly sample what the unknown quantity that you didn't have access before, namely the product of the, uh, of the, of the averages. And this is a, uh, if you now come back and you now look at the error for, the, for our toy model, the error in the diagonal matrix elements, whereas before you had this positive bias, now with this replica trick, that bias is entirely removed and uh, the error is now symmetrically distributed about zero, which is what you want it to be. Um, so that's the paper in which uh, this has been published in. And uh, the results are really staggering. Uh, here you have, in red, the, the result that you get from the density matrix, but has now been calculated through this replica trick. And essentially already a totally trivial number of walkers, whereas before you had this huge error you're more or less bang on top of the, uh, of the exact result. So in, in this blow-up, you actually see, uh, see, the, uh, see the behavior. And you can see it's a very, very fine energy scale uh, that we're dealing with now. Interestingly enough, the density matrix formulation is much better when you're dealing with strongly correlated systems. In other words, the fluctuations in energy are much, much more controlled than, than the corresponding fluctuations uh, that you get from the uh, trial weight, uh, from the projected energy. So this is for the stretch C2 molecule, which is a very difficult, strongly correlated system. And you see that the, uh, there are actually error bars, by the way, in red here. They're not really visible. But you can see the error bars in green. Those are the errors that you have. Oh, it's 3 o'clock already, is it? OK, those are the error bars that you have already. Um, uh, uh, for the projected energy is much larger. Okay, so I said that you can calculate uh, nuclear gradients now, so we can routinely calculate these density matrices, and from those density matrices, you can now routinely calculate the derivatives, the nuclear derivatives. This is an example of the N2 molecule, which as you stretch it, you know, you break the triple bond, so it's a very, again, a very difficult, strongly correlated limit. And shown here, so this is the, the energy, the binding curve, and you have here the force curve uh, that you calculate from this uh, gradient, from this trick. And you can see, for example, at the minimum, where you expect the force to be zero. That's indeed, uh, that's indeed uh, what is observed. So this is an example of a, of a, of a property that uh, we, had, uh, we have now access to. Um, Okay, I'm running short of time, so I'm going to skip the section on, on other properties, response functions. Okay, so maybe I'll just quickly uh, uh, finish with uh, an extension of our algorithm now to calculating excited states. So excited states is, uh, is always a more difficult problem. Uh, so if the ground state has a, sign prob uh, has, a, has a sign problem, you can expect the excited states to have an even worse sign problem, uh, so to speak. And... Um, so we, we struggled with different ways of getting excited states, including quadratic operators, uh, h minus a constant squared, and so on. But none of them work. But what does work is, in a way, the simplest uh, thing that you can think of, which is to perform a Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization, but applied instantaneously to, dis to different distributions of walkers. So now that we have the code, thanks to the replica trick, where you can run two or even multiple simulations simultaneously, uh, what we decided to do was to evolve one population 
according to the original Hamiltonian, and then a second uh, population with that, the original Hamiltonian in which you projected out the instantaneous distribution from the ground state uh, calculation. And then from those two, you could instantaneously project out those two distributions to get an, an evolution of a second excited state and so on. So I was pretty sure this wasn't going to work because you only have a very coarse description at any snapshot and you might not think that actually orthogonalizing with respect to a coarse snapshot uh, would get you anywhere. But it more or less worked out of the box. So when I asked uh, Simon Smart, one of my postdocs, to code this up, 20 minutes later he came back and said, you better come and have a look at these results. Uh, and so this is, this, is, this is the first calculation that we did for the C2 molecule. And we actually had three populations, one shown in red, and then one shown in blue and one shown in green. And uh, the blue and the green calculations were started off from the Hartree-Fock determinant where you've just performed a random single excitation into another determinant that has the same symmetry as the ground state. So these are genuine excited states. And what we found was, bang, you see the original uh, wave function, the original population settles down here. And then these two actually settle down. So there are the first and second excited states are very nearly degenerate with each other. And uh, so if we now blow this up, um, I'll actually blow it up a little bit more. Uh, so you see this population here settles on its ground state. And these two, one of them comes and settles on the first excited state. And this uh, uh, purple population, they kind of repel each other at this point. And this one now settles down on the second excited state. These, the first and second excited states are only separated by six milliheart trees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In this case, yeah. So they were, uh, they, we were using these, uh, this, uh, this uh, simple symmetry in order to do that. You can see that, of course, because they're only separated by about six milliheart trees, uh, and the t projection time is inversely proportional to the splitting, uh, you can see that you have to simulate for many hundreds of, uh, so this is in atomic units, I think it was here, imaginary time in, in, in atomic units, you have to simulate by, for several hundreds of, uh, of units of imaginary time, but that's just the name of the game. You couldn't project it out any more quickly with these type of projector uh, algorithms, but sure enough, you can see they basically uh, settle down Onto, uh, onto, uh, onto the respective uh, excited states. So um, uh, here, here is an application to the Hubbard model uh, for a system that you can exactly diagonalize. And um, so this is a 14-site Hubbard model. And um, again, so one, two, one, two, three, four, this is for five excited states, and you can see the kind of accuracy that one's able to hit. In other words, if there is a bias uh, which is arising because of the way we're doing this projection, it's really very small. Um, this is uh, another case, uh, excited states. Uh, this is C2 molecule, but in a larger basis set, quadruple zeta, where there are also very accurate DMRG calculations, uh, which have been done by... Uh, Sandeep Sharma, and um, what we're showing here is convergence of these uh, four, uh, well, ground state and three excited states uh, as a function of the number of walkers um, uh, with respect to the uh, DMRG results. And so essentially, by the time you get to about 10 million walkers, uh, you've uh, really nailed the calculation. It's uh, sub k cal per mole accuracy with respect to the DMRG calculations. So this is two different geometries, equilibrium and uh, stretch geometries uh, of C2. And these are, again, binding curves. It's very interesting. There are actually error bars on these, uh, on these plots, but these error bars are essentially uh, not visible on this scale. Okay, so... Uh, Shall I continue or should I stop here? Uh, 305. Okay, so as a final, final topic. Uh, 
I'll uh, mention um, another application, which is uh, uh, to, in quantum chemistry is called uh, CAS SCF. So, of course, it's nice to be able to do full CI calculations, but at some point, uh, you really run out of steam. I mean, uh, and that's the reality of, 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 the, of the problem. So at some point, you really, although we have a weakly exponential scaling algorithm, for a large enough number of electrons, you really feel the exponential scaling, and then you have to start making approximations. Now, uh, the common uh, approximation that's used in quantum chemistry is the, is the CAS-SCF approximation, whereby you say, you, 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 uh, you categorize the orbitals that describe your system into three, three types. Orbitals which are uh, called core orbitals in which you maintain the, uh, the, uh, the occupancy to be double, to be doubly occupied, so the core orbitals. Virtual orbitals, which are high-energy orbitals, where the occupancy is assumed to be strictly zero. And then you have these active orbitals, where the occupancy can range from two to zero. And um, the idea is then to perform a full CI expansion uh, uh, of assuming this type of truncation. So you still have a combinatorially large number of uh, uh, determinants to handle because you're distributing n electrons among m orbitals in your active space, but it's obviously a smaller combinatorial space than the full CI space. Okay, so that would be a single uh, full CI calculation. That's what we would be called CAS, complete active space. But now, what you then want to do is to perform uh, orbital rotations uh, uh, um, um, orbital rotations in order to obtain variationally the lowest possible uh, energy wave function that you can construct. So this kappa here is an anti-hermitian operator, so e to the minus kappa is then a unitary operator, it's a rotation, and so kappa consists of uh, uh, this matrix kappa consists of parameters kappa pq which are now the variational parameters in our in our um, in our theory, uh, and this EPQ is a is an, is a single particle ex, uh, excitation operator with the spins uh, traced out. Now, what you can show is that the derivative of the energy uh, with respect to the parameters in your kappa matrix uh, can be computed essentially as the commutator of the Hamiltonian. With, the, uh, 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 with this excitation operator, sandwiched between psi. And this is now an entity that we can calculate via our density matrix uh, code. And so, in other words, we can calculate the electronic gradient. And actually, you can show that you can not only calculate the electronic gradient, but you can also calculate the second derivatives, which basically brings in a nested commutator. But that's not a problem either. So once you've got your electronic gradient, in other words, you can now rotate your orbitals, which involves a mixing of the core orbitals with the active orbitals, or the uh, virtual orbitals with the active orbitals, or the core orbitals with the virtuals. You don't have to worry about active-active orbitals because they are, uh, 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 because you've calculated the full CI energy, it's invariant with respect to those, so those are redundant. Um, and uh, you can then iterate. So having performed a rotation, you now come back and once again perform your, your, your CAS calculation, which we now do with FCIQMC. So there's an out, outer macro iteration that involves the self-consistent step and the inner FCIQMC calculation that is the, um, that is the CI solver. So I should say that the largest CAS spaces that you can actually handle in practice with conventional algorithms is 18 orbitals, 18 electrons. That is pretty much the exact diagonalization. That is as far as you can go. 24 and 24, which is, of course, factorially larger, is completely out of the, out of the question. So this is now uh, an example, let's say, for the benzene molecule. Uh, 
uh, which where we're now treating the pi system. So you have six pi orbitals and six electrons. So it's something that you can do a conventional CAS SCF on. And uh, this is, so you see, these are the macro iterations and you get the behavior uh, both for a deterministic calculation or our stochastic calculation. The point is that we end up with the same, uh, same uh, energy at the end of the day. So we end up with the same solution. Now, the naphthalene molecule grows. Phenanthrene, so this is 14 in 14. That's still uh, uh, possible to do with a deterministic calculation. Uh, triphenylene, so that's 18 in 18. So that's really pushing deterministic calculations. But we can actually now go to a molecule like coronine and, coronine and correlate 24 electrons, 24 orbitals, and perform the self-consistent optimization of the orbitals uh, as well. Uh, so it's in about 13, 13 iterations we get there. But it's a relatively smooth uh, optimization uh, process. So anyway, that is the, uh, that's, if you like, is, the, is, our, is where we're going, is heading towards treating large molecules uh, like these within this CAS-SCF uh, CAS framework. Okay, and I think I will probably uh, stop there. Thank you. <laughs>